Hello everyone, I'm bringing you a video today covering a topic which I really haven't touched on on the channel previously at all, which is somewhat remiss of me. We're talking about greatcoats, and specifically the British 1939 pattern greatcoat, which is what we have here, and we're going to have a look at this in some detail. Obviously introduced basically at the start of the Second World War, it was then in production was switched to the 1940 pattern fairly soon after the introduction of this, which differs in certain details, and we'll talk a little bit about that in the course of this video. There'll be more videos going forward looking at other patterns of great coat, other services and so forth. But as I say, we're making a start with this and we're going to have a look at this in some detail now. So the overall design is a bit of a departure for other ranks, uh, great coat, dismounted great coat specifically, in that it is double breasted. Uh, so up to this point, you have the single breasted great coat, which had obviously been issued since prior to the, the Great War, in slightly modified form, but that was still on issue and is still seen in the early days of the Second World War. This introduces a, as I said, double-breasted design for dismounted use by other ranks. And it's a very smart greatcoat. Uh, the cut is quite flattering and it's quite a nice design overall. You can see we have the large lapels here which can be buttoned up. So this can be tucked underneath. The collar can be hooked up using a brass hook and eye here and it can be worn fastened all the way up if required. There are buttons underneath the collar here, one on that side to take the buttonhole on the lapel and obviously one on this side so that it is symmetrical as you can see there. In theory the collar can be buttoned up as well and there is a patch inside the greatcoat for that purpose which we'll see in just a minute or two and you can see here we have small four hole button there should be a corresponding one here unfortunately that is missing and I'm still on the hunt for a button of this pattern to replace that missing button there. So as you can see designed for Obviously, using cold weather, it can be buttoned right up to the collar if required. Normally, one like this, you have six buttons here, which are used to fasten it in this manner with the lapels open. And as I say, worn like this, it's very smart. You have that nice shape to this, uh, almost a sort of a faux lancer front, I guess you could say, in the way that the buttons taper in down there. There are angle pockets, which we'll see when we move this round to the side, and it is uh, calf length it comes down to the lower calf difficult to see in frame here it's difficult to get it in frame but you can see it comes right down there hopefully that gives some indication of the length of this it comes down to the lower calf and that's it, if it fits properly if it's worn with the intended fit that's the idea so that's the front of this we'll start moving this around now and have a look at some of the other details looking at the right hand side of this we can see various other features of the design i turn the collar up here you can see the reinforcing stitching underneath the collar there, and again, that four hole button, which allows the collar to be fastened up if required. We do have an epaulette on the shoulder here, as you can see, and that fixes is uh, held in place by a smaller general service button, as you can see there, general service brass button. Uh, quite short, doesn't run right up to the collar, but we do have an epaulette there, as you can see. The sleeve of this is shaped in a similar manner to battle dress, so it's slightly curved forwards and as mentioned previously this is intended to give greater freedom of movement when bringing a rifle up to the shoulder it's bent to uh, it's, it's sort of swept forward to assist in that movement and having the arms in that position and you can see that's basically carried directly across from battle dress uniform it's the same sort of shape to the arm there as you can see if we lift the arm up here you can see the, the darts here bringing the waist in we have angled pockets here drill lined underneath the flap there and we'll see the bags of those when we turn this inside out and have a look at the internal details but that's otherwise pretty plain there obviously as you can see there's no ventilation or anything it is a great coat it's intended for wear in very cold conditions so you can see that there I say no nothing else to see here really we won't have a look at the left hand side before turning this inside out we will have a look at the back of course there's quite a bit of detail to look at there so we'll have a look at the back now and then turn this inside out and have a look at the internal details looking at the back here you can see well a lack of a feature which differentiates this from the 1940 pattern. The 1940 pattern has a large open vent in the rear or, or a large pleat that allows the back to expand. In theory, it could be worn over equipment from that point of view. That's missing from this design. So that's one of the major features that differentiates the 1939 pattern we have here. From the 1940 pattern, the 1940 pattern has that expansion in the rear missing from this design. So you can see we just have a plain seam running down the middle here. You have a belt at the rear here with three small general service buttons there to secure that. There are slots, so this can be unbuttoned and tucked out of the way or fastened internally if required. You can see those underneath here, and this is drill lined. You can see that there. We'll see the slots more clearly when we turn this inside out. And then at the back here, we do have a, a, a buttoned vent down at the bottom with two small general service buttons, as you can see there. And obviously this vent here can be unbuttoned if required for greater movement. So you have that 
so running from just below the, uh, the rear of the buttocks there down to the bottom that can be opened up if required. So that's the back of this. We'll turn this inside out now and have a look at the lining and the other internal details. With this turned inside out, we can see more of the details of the construction. You can see that reinforcing stitching, that zigzag stitching runs all the way around the collar there. Hopefully that shows up in camera. You can see the lining of this. So we have lining running around under the arms and up to the shoulders here, reinforcement basically. And then we have lining at the sleeves here. This lining material is khaki drill. The lining material of the sleeves is more of a sort of very fine white canvas. We open this up here, you can see the details of where the buttons attach down that side and the buttons attach down here. We have that flap there with two small four hole buttons to secure it. And this is intended for buttoning up the collar with the two buttons up here if required. As I say, do need to replace that button, try and find a suitable replacement for that. But that's the, the piece that's intended to button the collar together there if required. Moving further down, we have the bags for the pockets here, you can see on each side and then we have the label and the ink stamp in the front here and we'll get a close-up of this now unfortunately the label is quite heavily worn but the ink stamp does give the sizing and we'll have a look at that in detail now so you can just make out on the label a great coat and then something pattern at the top the manufacturer and the size details are pretty much obliterated apart from size number seven and that is replicated above in ink so you have the size there of seven five nine to eleven I think that should be. And this white ink stamp is a typical feature of great coats right the way through to the 1951 pattern. They include this ink stamp, this white ink stamp very commonly as an easy way of reading the size within these as opposed to referring to the smaller text on the label. So details of the ink stamp and the label there. Moving this round, you can see the sleeve lining there coming down to just about an inch above the hem of the sleeve there. You can see the lining coming round the shoulders here and that runs around underneath the arm as you can see it's loose at the bottom here and then we have the bag for the hip pocket there as you can see so further details of the construction down the right hand side there looking at the back here there are a few more features to talk about you can more clearly see that lining which comes down from the shoulders here and that's loose at the bottom here and just tacked in place in the center just on the center seam here and obviously that runs around underneath the arms there and forward to the shoulder seam up here we lift the collar up, you can see we did have a hanging tab up here. This is unfortunately broken at some point in this coat's life. It's made of the same heavyweight drab fabric as the rest of the great coat, lined with drill. And hopefully you can see that there. But unfortunately, due to the weight of the garments and use, it has uh, broken at some point in the past. So that is up there. It should be obviously a hanging tab running across the collar. You can see here the slots I mentioned for the waist belt and you can see those there they open up and so the, the waist belt the rear half belt can be slotted through those if required. You can see the centre seam running down here and then we have that vent at the bottom and you can see the stitching for the two buttons there. Obviously the slots both reinforced with khaki drill material as well. So that's the back of the interior of this. So I hope you found it interesting looking at this. As I said there will be more videos going forward looking at great coats and overcoats so it's just a topic I've not covered on the channel previously. I'm not quite sure why. So we'll make good on that and have a look at some other patterns of great coat. But hopefully it's been interesting looking at this one. If you have found it interesting and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're new to subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as I always say, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It really is greatly appreciated, as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.